Yes, give her a hand. Good morning. I ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 24. And the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave the name to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Let us pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, Lord, for realizing our need long before we do. Lord, you know what we, what we need much more than our wants. And Lord, thank you most of all for providing, for providing us a Savior. Father, we pray this morning that uh, we'll hear these truths. They'll lie deep in our hearts. And Lord, that they will re-energize us as believers and convict the non-believers so that they can find you precious for this day. In your name we ask. Amen. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you. Join me as we sing this morning, Victory in Jesus.
Good morning, and welcome to Russell Springs First Baptist Church. If you are visiting with us, thank you for being here today, and we are glad that you're here. We have a gift for you in the foyer. Uh, if this is your first time here, stop by the, that uh, welcome table there, and we'd love to give you a gift and talk to you and have you fill out a connect card so that we can connect with you sometime this week. Uh, so thank you for being here today. If you look in your bulletin, there's a lot going on, and so... Uh, there in the in the center, there is uh, a sheet that has what's happening at RS1 in May. Uh, lots of good things. This is this is a really helpful uh, piece of paper. Put this on your refrigerator. Uh, Susie does a great job of putting that together. But lots of good stuff happening uh, during the month of May uh, today. Uh, we have a baby shower from two to four uh, in the Go Center for uh, new Blankenship coming into the world soon, and so come and celebrate with them. Uh, it's a two to four, uh, and so come and uh, share with, with the excitement of their new baby coming soon with them. Uh, we also have a WMU meeting at three o'clock. This is the associational WMU meeting, uh, and so um, come and uh, and learn a little bit more about what WMU is doing in, in, in Russell County uh, at three o'clock. Uh, next Sunday uh, is Mother's Day, and so if you haven't got your gift right, it's time. Uh, and so I'm just giving you a reminder, there's, uh, we're going to have a great day. It's going to be a, a good Sunday. We're going to celebrate moms. Uh, we're going to have a good time uh, with them. Got some gifts for moms next Sunday, but make sure that you get uh, your moms taken care of. Uh, and then on the 21st, we have graduation Sunday. Uh, it's a day for us to celebrate our graduates. And so if you are a graduate of high school, that day we'll be celebrating you. Uh, and then a, a reminder for our kids and youth programs, the last Wednesday night for those programs is Wednesday the 17th. Uh, that'll be our last Wednesday night programs until August, whenever school uh, comes back. Uh, and just a reminder for that. We've got lots of stuff going on for kids and youth throughout the summer, uh, but we won't have those regular Wednesday night programs. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward at this time. Um, one of the things that COVID did is it made us change a little bit of the way that our services were structured. Uh, but this morning we're gonna we're gonna bring back our collection of offerings. I want to remind you of this: you can still give online, and so you can go onto our website and go to, to give, and you can give online there. You can also still give in the offering boxes uh, in in the welcome center and also in the foyer, and so you can you can do that as well. Uh, but this morning first time in a while, uh, we're going to be collecting our offering, and so, Jeff, would you pray for us this morning? Will you bow with me, please? Lord, Father God, once again, uh, we come to you today, Father, and just come to praise you, to lift you up, to exalt you, Lord. We pray, Father, that uh, you take authority over this service this morning, Lord, that it be for your glory, for the glory of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that this offering, offering is blessed, Lord, that uh, be used according to your will. And Lord, we're going to give you the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
so much, Angela. Would you all please stand as we continue our worship this morning? Shall we gather at the river? Yes. 
pray with me this morning. Oh, God, we just thank you for being King of Kings this morning. Lord, you are majesty. You are far above everything on earth. Lord, we just want to remember that this morning. Lord, let us remember that this is nothing about us. Just put ourselves behind the cross, Lord, that we may put you out of our place. Lord, we just praise you and thank you this morning for all that you are and all that you do. Lord, we just give this service to you, our worship, our word. Lord, we just pray for Christian this morning as he brings your message. Father, thank you for all of your blessings. Go with us this week, Lord, and let us be the light that shines in this dark world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and while you're being seated, go ahead, take God's word. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5 this morning. We're going to finish up chapter 5, and then we just have two weeks left in our series through Ephesians. Uh, And so we're going to take two weeks to go through Ephesians chapter 6, and then after that we'll announce our new sermon series. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 through 33. As you turn there, I want to ask this question. If you had the secret to a good and godly marriage, would you be interested? Maybe this is for new couples or even for couples who have been married for several years. If you knew the secret to marriage, and if you knew that the Bible revealed to us the secret of marriage, would you be interested? Well, that's the question uh, we want to tackle this morning. In fact, uh, as, as we look into Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reminded of one of my favorite childhood movies, uh, Space Jam. And not the Space Jam with LeBron James, I'm talking the, the original Space Jam, right? You got Michael Jordan uh, with the original Looney Tunes, and, and there's this scene in Space Jam, where the Looney Tunes are getting obliterated by the Monstars, right? The first half of the basketball game, it does not go well. Uh, The score has been run up. It looks like it's impossible for the Looney Tunes to make a comeback. And so at halftime, there's this scene where the Looney Tunes and their beloved leader, Michael Jordan, takes them into the locker room. And MJ, you know, he's a competitor. Uh, Jordan was, man, he did not want to lose. And so as they're in the locker room, Man, Michael Jordan, he, he gives them this pump-up speech. I mean, it is, it is inspirational. It is this inspiring speech to get his team jacked up to go back in the second half, as most good coaches do. Well, well something interesting happened. At the end of Jordan's speech, the camera pans to the Looney Tunes. And, and Jordan put his heart and soul in his speech, and then all of a sudden you see the Looney Tunes, and they're fast asleep. Uh, there's this hilarious scene where all the characters, I mean, they're just snoring, their eyes are closed, and Michael Jordan is thinking, man, what is going on? I just put my heart and soul into this speech. Well, well, here's what's happening. Behind the scenes, Bugs Bunny, the, the genius, the witty Bugs Bunny, he knew this speech was not going to work. Uh, he knew it was boring. And so as the Looney Tunes are sleeping, Bugs Bunny gets up, and if you remember the scene, he, he takes this bottle, and he just goes and fills it up with regular tap water. Nothing special. He fills it up with regular tap water. Uh, And then if we can get that picture on the screen, uh, you see he takes that that yellow piece of paper and he writes Michael's secret stuff. There's nothing secret or special in here. It's just regular tap water. But what happens is is Bugs Bunny, he he takes this bottle of of Michael Jordan's secret stuff, and, and then he goes to the locker room. He wakes up the Looney Tunes, and he says, guys, 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 hey, listen, listen. I got Michael's secret stuff. And Jordan, he's confused for a little bit. He's like, man, what are you talking about? And all of a sudden, he gets what Bugs Bunny's doing. And so Michael Jordan begins to play along. He's like, oh, guys, I'm, I'm so sorry. I didn't, I didn't tell you about my secret stuff. Oh, oh you got to try it. And so Bugs goes around, and these, the Looney Tunes are freaking out. They're like, oh, my gosh, give me something. And they're fighting over the water bottle. They're all taking a drink, and they go up. I mean, they are jacked up. As they go out in the second half, they go on this big scoring run, and then eventually they win the game. And this placebo effect. This secret stuff that Bugs Bunny brings to the Looney Tunes, it plays a huge part in the comeback. Some of you this morning, you feel defeated uh, in your marriage. Uh, You feel, some of you have been through the first half of marriage, and and you feel defeated. You feel without hope. You feel like there's not a lot of hope going forward in your marriage. And some of you have tried, you've tried pump-up speeches, you've tried books, You've tried YouTube videos. You've tried everything you can, but it seems like your marriage is not the way that you would like it to be. And what you need this morning is some secret stuff. 
not secret placebo effect, not some secret stuff from some marriage guru, but you need the secret stuff that is revealed to us in God's Word. And so we're going to look at that uh, this morning. Here, here's what we find in marriage. In marriage, obviously, there are two people becoming one flesh. Uh, Jeff read that for us out of Genesis this morning. And, and what happens in marriage, when you're living together under the same roof, you quickly find out that there are some responsibilities that take place in marriage. So some little responsibilities. Anytime you're living with someone else, you have to come to the agreement and in, in who is responsible for what. And so when I do marriage counseling, I love doing premarital counseling. When I do that, I like to take a session and I like to think of little things uh, to show young couples who is responsible for what. And little things like, for example, who's going to cook. You know, in some households, the, the wife does most of the cooking. In some households, the, the husband is the better cook, and he does most of the cooking. Most of the time, it's, it's mutual, but that's something good to know. I, I like to take them. Here's what I'll do. I'll have them take this, this test, and I'll have them fill it out individually. And, and they'll fill it out individually, and then they'll come to my office, and they'll tell me their answers together, and, and it'll be things like, who's going to do most of the shopping? Who's going to, here's the big one, who's going to take out the trash? And not who's just going to take out the trash, but who's going to take it out, and then who's going to get the trash bag to put it in the trash can? Because if you've been married, you, you know that there's, there's a difference between taking out the trash and putting trash bags in the trash can. When we look at things like who will physically pay the bills, not, not like who will work, not so much that, but who is physically going to write that check out or who's going to physically set up the automatic withdrawals with the bill company. Uh, we look at things like who's going to file taxes. I like to see married couples who maybe have never filled out taxes before decide who is going to take on. Uh, that's my least favorite thing in the world, and so I quit doing it. Uh, I mean, somebody fills it out for me, but uh, who's going to fill out the taxes? Uh, who's going to mow the lawn? Who's going to do the budget? Uh, budget, what are you talking about? Yeah, who's going to do the budget? Th those are little bitty things that I like to mention in, in premarital counseling because there's little things that you don't think about. And what I want to do is I want married couples, as they go into their marriage and they move into their house together, to understand some of the little responsibilities that might keep them way, away from an argument or fight early on in marriage. But here's what we know. Biblically, there are also responsibilities in marriage that God has given the husband and the wife. Uh, he doesn't say specific things like the husband needs to take out the trash or, or the wife needs to cook dinner. There's not specific things like that. But there are specific responsibilities that we see in Scripture. And so we're going to look at that this morning. So look with me in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Verse 22 says this. It says, wives... Submit to your own husbands. That word submit means to arrange under. Uh, it's a military term. Uh, it's the idea of arranging yourself under a general or, or, or someone who is over you in the military. Uh, and, and here's what we see. A lot of times we'll read, wives submit, and, and all of a sudden we stop there, and some people get angry at the Bible at this word, right? So some people, that they read this, wives submit to your husbands, and, and they just focus on this idea, wives submit, and they don't want to go any further. Whether you grew up in the church or maybe in a, in a secular home, sometimes this idea of submission, it, it confuses people. And what will happen is that when people see the phrase, as we see in verse 22, wives submit, they will begin formulating their own ideas on submission. And what they'll do is they'll disregard the rest of the text. In other words, they're missing out on what God is calling the wife and even what happens later, the husband to do. And so here's what we want to do this morning is, is not only look at the responsibilities here in verse 22, but also look at the responsibilities following for the husband as well, and to look at the context of this passage, because that's going to help us understand this verse. And so let, let me start off with this. As we start off with the idea of wives uh, submit, not, not a popular verse uh, in Scripture, but as we start off with that, for us to understand what submission means and, and what it is, it's best for us to understand what submission is not. A lot of times you can understand things better, understanding what they're not, uh, and then you can come up with the idea of what something truly is. And so let me give you some examples of what submission is not, uh, and this is very important for us in understanding this verse. And so number one is this, submission, and listen to me, men, submission is not the stereotypical designation given by society that women are the sandwich makers. You know what I'm saying? You've seen memes and things on social media where the husband says, wife, hey, you make me a sandwich and, and hey, grab me, a, grab me a Coke or something. Or, you know, you've seen that before. That's not what submission is. 
Submission is not giving the husband the authority just to bark commands at his wife and for her to serve him whenever he says so. That's not what submission is talking about. The word submit does not translate to sandwich maker. Everybody got that? That's not what it is. Submission is not. Also, it is not a downgrade in position. It is not a downgrade on the wife. Submission, it is not an inferior identification. Wives submit, in this, in this passage, Paul is not saying that they are of lesser value than men. He's not saying that men are better than women. In fact, Paul knows this, that both man and woman, both husband and wife, are made in the image of God. In fact, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, Paul says something very similar. He says, there is neither Greek nor Jew. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. What is Paul speaking of? He, he's speaking of the equality between husband and wife, between man and woman. And so submission is not an inferior identification. Submission is also not permission. And listen, I think, I think most of us know this, but I, I feel like it, it's good to point out submission is not permission to mentally or physically abuse uh, your wife. That, that's 100% not what submission is. It does not give you permission uh, to do that. Uh, And submission, here's the last thing, is submission is not exclusive to wife, okay? Submission is not just exclusive to the wife. How do we know that? Well, let's use context, all right? Ephesians chapter 5, look up at verse 21. Verse 21, Paul writes this. He says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Who's Paul speaking of here? When Paul says in verse 21, submitting to one another, who is Paul speaking of? Well, in order for us to understand who Paul's speaking to, let's go up a few verses once again and use some context clues to see who Paul is speaking to. Look with me in verse 18. Verse 18, it says this, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So who's verse 21 talking about? Verse 21 says, submitting to one another. Who is verse 21 speaking to? It is speaking to the Spirit-filled Christian. What we see, we are to be filled with the Spirit. And then we get down to verse 21, and it says, those who are filled with the Spirit, and Paul is writing, of course, to Christians in Ephesus, but he's specifically right here talking to those who are filled with the Spirit, who are all Christians who have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. Those who are filled with the Spirit, guess what? They should be, as a result of having the Spirit and being filled with it, they should submit to one another in reverence for Christ. In other words, the Spirit-filled Christian is called to humble submission of one another. They're called to be servant-hearted. And this goes right along with the Christian walk, the idea of not exalting oneself, right? Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul says it this way. He says, let each of you, this is male and female, this is all Christians, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. It's this idea of, of humble submission in a sense where you're not selfishly looking at yourself, but you're looking at, hey, how can I help and how can I be a joy to others as well? But here, here's what's key. A spirit-filled Christian submits to one another. The rest of that verse in verse 21 says this. It says, out of reverence for Christ. So you see, verse 21, it shows that submission is not a bad word. So sometimes culture, or sometimes our own minds make us think that the word submission is a bad word. Submission it is not a bad word. In fact, we are to do it, all Christians, in verse 21 tells us, all Christians are to do it out of reverence for Christ. In other words, submission is a call for Christians to bring glory to God. let's, Let's make it simple. We submit for Jesus Christ. This is what Paul is saying in the text. So verse 22, Paul continues this thought. Submit to one another, and then as we get to verse 22, he's just continuing this thought, and now he's speaking particularly to the role of marriage. He says, wives, submit to your husbands. Wives, your your, your call in marriage, as we think of the idea of submission, as Paul, as he makes a transition from verse 21 to submit to one another, to to verse 22, to wives, submit to your husbands. As we make this transition, here's what Paul is saying, and I think in basic terms for us to understand, he's saying, wives, your call to marriage is to follow the spiritual and godly leadership of your husband. 
This is simply what what Paul is calling for wives to do, to follow after the the spiritual guidance and the godly leadership of their husbands. Now, Now notice when he speaks to the wives, he also says this. He says, wives, submit to your husbands, to your own husbands, and that's an important point. You're not to submit to other people's husbands. It's not you submit to every single man. It's you submit to your husband. And then look what he says, as to the Lord. In other words, the the same as we see in verse 21, this this idea of submission, once again, it brings glory to God. This act of submission, it brings glory to God. In fact, if you're not convinced yet by submission being a good word in Scripture, a good command from God, think about Christ, right? Christ is leader, and in a minute we're going to look at Christ as the head of the church. But but what did Christ do in his ministry on earth? He, He submitted to who? To the authority of his Father. In fact, he, he, he submitted on the cross. He didn't have to die. He was not forced to die. He voluntarily submitted, gave his life, following the will of the Father so that all could be saved. And so Jesus Christ, he paints the perfect picture of what submission looks like. Submission, it's, it's not a bad word. It, it's what we see in, in Scripture, but sometimes culture has given us a misunderstanding of what it is. But look with me in verse 23. Verse 23, we go on to the husbands now. So wives, you can relax. Husbands, you are on the pedestal. So the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to the husbands. Going back to the wives, here's what we understand. Verse 23 through 24, marriage is this. Marriage, and even if you're not married, I think think young, uh, our our students, even if you're not married, it's good to listen to a sermon on marriage, to go ahead and prepare yourself on, on what a godly wife looks like and what a godly husband looks like. And so understand this about marriage. Marriage is a beautiful picture between the relationship of Christ and his church. In other words, marriage, it is a picture of Jesus and his bride. Who is his bride? It's us. It's the church. It's all those who have been saved. And, and this is the beauty in marriage. See, church, understand this. We as the church, we as the body of Christ, we all submit to the headship of Christ. Therefore, we see God calling wives to submit to their husbands as it represents and mimics the relationship of Jesus Christ and the church. Once again, submission is not a negative action, but it is spiritual worship. It is spiritual worship. It's the call of the entire body of Christ as well, as we to submit to Jesus Christ. This is the beauty of marriage. But then we get to verse 25. Husbands, Listen to me. Here's what Paul says through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Husbands, love your wives. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now, now some of y'all might be thinking, really, Paul? <laughs> like, 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 that's the only command you give to husbands? Husbands, love? Like, isn't that a given in marriage? Like, isn't that the point of, of, of marriage? Like, you're supposed to love one another? Are, are the husbands so... Can I use this word? Are husbands so dumb that they just need to know you're supposed to love in marriage? This seems like such a simple command, right? Really? You got to remind my husband to love me. Well, women, remember this, us guys, we are simple-minded creatures, and we need to be reminded of simple things. Amen, ladies? You didn't have to say it. Gabby, did you say that? Oh, shoot. Gabby's the only one. Husbands, um, when we, we think of the idea of loving our wives, we, we understand that not only are we simple-minded and we need to understand this, but here's what we're going to see throughout Scripture today is we tend, to, we tend not to do so good in this area. In, in other words, what, what am I saying? We tend to struggle, guys, we, st- we tend to struggle in the area of love. This is one, one of our, our struggles. But, but also, here's what you need to know, and we're going to get into this la- later on, is husbands, you need to know this, your wife she desperately needs your love. She needs it. That's one of her greatest desires is to be loved by you. So, so, so husbands, I'm going to, look, we start talking about submission and all, all, all the women are like, oh, shoot. Guys, I'm getting ready to crack down on the husbands because I think sometimes we look at that verse and we forget the higher calling that God is calling the husbands to. It's difficult. So let's talk about it. First thing. Husbands, love your wives. How are we to love our wives? Number one is this. We're going to look at three things for husbands. Husbands, love your wife sacrificially. Look at verse 25. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. What do we see with Christ? 
Jesus Christ, if we are to love as Christ loved the church, and we talked about this a little bit last week as we were called to walk in love, look what Christ did. Christ showed love to his bride. Christ showed love to his church by dying for her. And husbands, check this out. We are called to sacrificially love our wives. Christ, in his sacrificial love, literally died. Let me say this, men. You understand that that sacrificial love is is kind of ingrained in you, right? What do you mean, Christian? Like, I think in men, we understand this idea of sacrificial love. We just need to be reminded of it in marriage. Let me say this. It's 2 a.m. I think this will help us understand. It's 2 a.m., right? And all of a sudden, you hear... Wife wakes up. Hey, did you hear that? <laughs> hear what? It, it's a true story. It's happened to me and Gabrielle the other day. It's 2 a.m. And, and something fell. And she wakes me up. And she says, you hear that? And I had no clue what she was talking about. I said, hear what? And, and she told me there's something going on. All right, 2 a.m., husbands. You hear something. And obviously your wife is thinking, man, somebody's got a gun in our house. And they're trying to kill our whole family. That's the first thought that goes in a woman's head. Like, like we're in danger. Even though all the doors are locked, we're in danger. And so in this situation, you ask this question. Here's what I asked. You want me to go check on it? Yes. All right. So here I come, I go to check on this bad guy. Now, now, now let, me just, let me just say this. I go to check on this bad guy. I'm not worried. I'm, I'm half asleep. Don't even know what's going on. But, but I go out there. Why? Because it is ingrained in me as the man to go out and protect my family. In other words, if somebody has a gun, they're coming in my house. It's just ingrained to me that, guess what? I'm going to be the volunteer to die, right? Like, I'm going to die for my family. Her husbands, if you get woken up at 2 a.m., is your wife going to go check on it? No, you can answer that. You don't have to be scared. Your wife is not. If your wife goes checks on something at 2 a.m. and you stay in bed, you come and talk with me. We're going to have some counseling sessions, right? This is not, this is not like, even for secular society, I don't know of, of any woman. This is ingrained in the men to, to die for their spouse. And here's what Paul is saying. Look, it's already been ingrained in you. Now, here's what I'm telling you. You need to sacrificially love your wife. And in a sense, men, we're honored to do it. We're honored to, to risk our lives and, and die for the protection of our family, whether you have a gun or no gun, whether you have a black belt in karate or you're just waking up in your whitey tighties, it don't matter. You are called, and there's this ingrained sense in you, to go protect your family, even if it means sacrificially risking your life. And God calls us to this. He says, love her sacrificially. But, but I give this funny example I think it makes a point, uh, but sacrificial love is so much more than that, right? Sacrificial love, it's so much more than, than just this, this example that we have given. In fact, sacrificial love, it involves giving and, and sacrifice. And in fact, men, there are some things in your life that you are called to sacrifice for the good of your wife. As you are called to, to, to love your wife as Christ loved the church, here's what we understand. Christ gave everything for the church, and in the same sense, you're to give everything. That, that means your life, your desire, some of the things you want to do. Now, now, ladies, understand this. Yes, let your husbands have a hobby and let them have fun and, and let them go to the golf course. Yes, yes do that. But, but husbands, there might be some things because you are called to sacrificially love your wife. There might be some things that you have to give up for the good of your wife. They don't teach you that in premarital counseling most of the time. That's just something that comes as a surprise to me. But as a husband, that is my calling. It might mean you have to watch a little less TV at night to give a little more time to your wife. Ouch, that one hurts, right? You might have to give up some things so that your wife can have and you can give her the love that she desires. This can be the case, but husbands, this is how we are called to love, to love sacrificially. Number two, we're called to lead spiritually. Look at verse 26. Verse 26, it says, that he, and this is talking specifically about Christ, but it's going to relate to the husband as well, that Christ might sanctify her, the church, having cleansed the church by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or with any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Now, verse 26 and 27 is speaking specifically of Christ and how he gave his life for the church, but he also sanctifies the church. He makes us holy. He presents us as, as righteous and, and pure. This is speaking of the church, but there is a sense where this is speaking to husbands as well. Now, now husbands, understand this. We can't literally sanctify and cleanse our wives as Christ has sanctified and cleansed us of our sins. We don't have that power or authority. That, that is given to Christ. But, but husbands, listen to me. 
what we can do is we can, we, we can lead her. And we can present our wives, and not just our wives, we're going to talk about this next week, we can present our families as holy before God. Let me say this, and if you don't, men, if you don't hear anything else today, hear this. It is our job to spiritually lead every day, to lead our wives every day where they become closer and closer to Christ. This is a simple calling, but, but this, is, this is an important calling. It is our job to lead our wives and our families to where every day they are growing closer to Christ. So, so here's a painful question, men, I want you to answer. Whether you've been married for a year, whether you've been married for, for 50 years, answer this question. Men, is your family, here's a hurt, is the question hurt? Is your family less spiritual because of you? Think about that. Here's what we see a lot of times. A lot of times the wife seems to be the most spiritual one in the family because the husband doesn't rise up and lead. This is a question I want to ask. Men, is your family less spiritual because of you? Or are you like a Joshua? Or are you like a Joshua who says, you know what, for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. No matter what culture says, no matter what else happens, we in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And I might not be perfect, but I'm going to lead my family the best I can so that they can get closer and closer to Christ. Husbands, this is the call that we have on our life from God. Now, now let me say this. Your wife may be a better Christian than you. That's okay. Gabby's a lot better Christian than I am, and more than likely your wife is a better Christian than you are. But you can still spiritually lead her. In fact, I believe this is calling to present our wives and our families as holy before the Lord, to do it the best we can to the best of our ability. We are called to show what it's like to imitate Christ. Remember chapter 5, verse 1? Remember last week, therefore be imitators of God. How do we imitate God? We walk in love, we walk in the light, and we walk in wisdom. And so husbands, we're called to walk in these ways so that our family can watch us and that they can take after our example, leading them closer and closer to Jesus. And so number two, we're, we're to spiritually lead our wives. Number three is this. Uh, we see that we are to love our wives as our own body. Look, look, look with me in verse 28 this morning. Verse 28, it says, In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. We're to love her as our own body. Now, what does this mean? What does it mean to love our wife as we love our own body. Well, think about it this way. I mean, as you take care of your own body and you take care of, of your own needs, guess what? As you do that for yourself, as a married man, you are now responsible for the needs of your wife as if they were your needs. These include her physical needs, her, her spiritual needs, her, her, her mental needs. As you would take care of your own needs, guess what? As you're called to love your wife as your own body, you are now called to take care of her needs as well, as if her body was your body. Now, men, why am I saying this? Because your body is her body. What do I mean? Well, look what Paul references. Paul references verse 31 right after this. And he's going back to the story of creation. He's going back to Genesis chapter 2, the beginning, the very first marriage. And he says, therefore, this is what marriage is. A man shall what? A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to the wife. And the two now, guess what? The two then become one flesh. And so, men, when you consider your needs as one flesh, you should want to and you should simultaneously be considering the needs of your wife as well. Any decision you make that is based off your needs, you should always have your, your wife in mind as well because it's not just about your needs anymore. It's about hers. You are one flesh and you are called, as the head of the marriage that God has given you, you are called to not only lead her and love her, but to love her as your own body. You're to love her as your own flesh because you are one flesh now. So look with me in verse 32. Verse 32 says this. Paul says, he uses the word mystery again. He says, this mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. But what mystery is Paul talking about? Hey, he's just, context, hey, he's looking right back to what he just said. The, two, the mystery is that two become one flesh. He's referring to the mystery of Christ 
and the church. Now, now here, here's what's beautiful, and I want you to, I want you to understand this about marriage. I, I like to use this, and anytime I, I do a marriage, I like to use this idea that when we look at marriage, we have to understand the providence and the sovereignty of God in the fact that when he created the world and he created the very first marriage, he already had salvation through Christ as a plan. What do you mean, Christian? What, what, what do you mean? See, God knew his plan all along was to send Jesus Christ to save the world. How do we know this? Because when he made marriage, the very first marriage, what was it to be? He knew thousands of years later, Paul would write in Ephesians, through the inspiration of God himself, that marriage was a reflection of Christ and the church. And so in the very first marriage, see, see God, he was way ahead of the game. He already knew that he was going to send Christ to save us. And what does he do in the very first marriage? He is, he is foreshadowing the relationship between husband and wife. He's foreshadowing the relationship that would then occur between Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. And so God had this plan all along. Husbands and wives, these are responsibilities in marriage. This is what God has called us to. But, but, but let me finish with this. And as I promised before, at the very beginning, we're going to learn the secret stuff this morning. What is the secret stuff? Well, look with me in verse 33. Uh, it's not much of a secret if you read your scriptures, uh, but verse 33, it shows us the secret to what I believe is a good and godly marriage. It says this, however, let each one of you, once again, love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Church, church, what is the secret to any good and godly marriage? It's love and it's respect. Well, we talk a lot about love and marriage. Rarely do we talk about the two being combined. The idea that the husband is called to love and that the wife is called to respect. We just finished in a, a few, about two weeks ago, we had finished a 10-week series on marriage. And so we had about over 20 people in this small group. We met on Thursday nights here at church. And we went over what a godly marriage looks like. And the, the book we were using was literally called Love and Respect. Uh, Dr. Emerson Edricks, a former pastor, uh, he now travels uh, the world doing these love and respect conferences. He led, and we went through his workbook on basically what Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33 is saying, the idea of love and respect. Do Dr. Um, Edricks, here's what he says in a study at the very beginning of our, um, of our small group. He says this. He says, they asked 7,000 people this question. The question was, when you are in conflict with your spouse, all right, married couples, think about this. When you are in conflict with your spouse or significant other, do you feel unloved in that moment, or do you feel disrespected? And so they asked 7,000 people, if in a conflict, do they feel unloved or disrespected? 83% of men said they felt disrespected. 72% of women, women said they felt unloved. What do we understand from, from this data? Well, generally speaking, God has uniquely designed men and women in specific ways. And generally speaking... Men desire to be respected, and women desire to be loved. Not, not that women want to be respected as well, not that men want to be loved. They do, but, but generally speaking, men more so desire respect, and women more so desire to be loved. Why is this? This is the way God has created us. Uh, let, let me give you an example of this. Here's what I've learned. I've, I've not been married four years yet, uh, so I still got a long way to go. Me and Gabrielle still learning a lot. Uh, but I understand this concept. Uh, Gabrielle, not long ago, looked me in the eyes, uh, and she asked this question. Man, I'm sure you've gotten this question before. Uh, and let me remind you, we've been married over three years. I know not a crazy amount, but it's a good, amount, uh, a good amount that we know each other. Uh, she looked me in the eyes, and she said, Christian, do you love me? All right, here's what I'm thinking. I'm still here, ain't I? You know, like, like I come home every single night. Like, like you, you, Gabby, you know, I thought, like, am I doing something wrong? Like, like you know that I love you. Me and have you ever gotten that question before? Occasionally, I'll get this question from Gabrielle, do you love me? To me, to me, church, gosh, this answer, for me, it seems obvious. But, but you know what? As a wife who desires to be loved, as a woman who God has made to, to desire love so much, and she needs love, and she needs love for, for her husband, here's what I know, is that she just wants to hear it and to be assured by it. Why? Because that's her great desire. Now, now let, let's check out my side, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think I've ever asked Gabrielle if she loves me. Have I, have I asked 
I, I've never, I know Gabby loves me. In fact, usually women are better at showing love, and she does a better job at it than, than I do. Why? She's uniquely designed by God to show love. There has never been a moment in my life that I have doubted that Gabrielle ha- has loved me. Why? Well, one, she does a great job at it, but, but two, here's the thing. That's not my, yes, I, I want to be loved, and I, I love love, and, and I love the love that God gives, and, and I love the love that's in our marriage. But, man, my deepest desire that I want for my wife is, is I'd rather be respected than I would love. I mean, don't get me wrong. I want to be loved in church. I want you guys to, to love me, but, but as a man, I, honestly, I, I'd rather be respected and loved. And I think, generally speaking, most men would agree with this as well, as most women are natural lovers. But here's what I know. I, I never doubt her love. But sometimes she just needs to hear it from me. Christian, do you love me? Why? That's her desire. I'll finish with this, and I'm going to take this from our, from our marriage study from the past 10 weeks. Uh, there are three cycles that Dr. Emerson goes through. And I want to go through these three cycles very quickly uh, when it comes to marriage. And I think this will help us understand what Paul is calling us to in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. Uh, the first cycle is this. It's called the crazy cycle. Now, now, don't worry. Every marriage has been in the crazy cycle. Uh, and every marriage sometimes will go back to the crazy cycle. What we want to do is to get out of the crazy cycle. In a nutshell, here's what the crazy cycle is, explained by Dr. Edricks. He says, without love, she reacts without respect. And without respect, he reacts without love. And so what happens sometimes in marriage is you you get in this constant cycle is that the husband doesn't show love to his wife, and as a result, the wife doesn't show respect to her husband because she doesn't feel loved, and then the husband doesn't feel respected, and he doesn't feel respected, and as a result, he says, you know what, I'm just not going to show love to her because I get no respect, and and then it gets in this constant crazy cycle, and and some marriages, if they're not careful, they'll stay in the cycle forever, or it will result in something devastating, this crazy cycle. But here's what Emerson says, there's something also called the energizing cycle. We want to get to the energizing cycle, and the energizing cycle is this idea, is that his love motivates her respect, and her respect motivates his love. In other words, the two that have become one flesh, they're working together in the marriage, that, that for example, if I use me and Gabrielle, I want to show love to her, and as a result of me showing love to her, more than likely, it's going to result in her being motivated to show respect to me, and when I get more respect from her, I want to continue to love her more, and then she gets that, and she wants to continue to show respectful ways to me more, and then it's just this ongoing cycle. It's the, the energizing cycle that, that husbands and wives in marriage, we motivate each other. And then there is the rewarded cycle, uh, which is a beautiful thing, but it can also be a difficult thing uh, depending on the marriage. The rewarded cycle is this. It's that his love is to be regardless of her respect. And her respect is to be regardless of his love. What do you mean? The Bible simply tells us this. Husbands, your job is to love, in verse 33, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is where it gets difficult at times. Because sometimes wives, let's say this, wives, sometimes your husband is just not a very loving husband and they just haven't been loving to you <clears throat> in the past few weeks or, or months or, or who knows, even years. And as a result <clears throat> of you not feeling maybe respected, you, you feel like you don't want to show love to your wife. The same way, w- women, you might, you might feel like you haven't been loved and as a result of you not feeling loved, you feel like, hey, this man, he doesn't deserve respect, Right? He he hasn't showed love to me. He doesn't deserve my respect. Because in culture, here's what we believe, is that you have to earn respect. And yes, you do have to earn trust. But when it comes to biblical marriage, the wife is called to respect regardless of his love. And the man is called to love regardless if she respects or not. And here's the hope of it. The hope is that let's say you're in a marriage where there's not love or respect. The hope is what we would follow this command in Scripture And let's say there's a wife who doesn't feel loved by her husband, and as a result, she says, you know what, even though he's not loving me, I'm going to unconditionally follow the scriptures and show unconditional respect to him. And the goal is, here's what I believe happens in this, and Dr. Emerson talks about this, most of the time, here's what you're going to see, the wife is going to show respect to her husband, and he's going to know he doesn't deserve it. And as a result, you know what, it's going to motivate him to love. We could take this vice versa. You, you know, there, there, might be, there might be a husband who doesn't feel respected, but you know what? He says, even though I don't feel respected in my home, I'm going to show unconditional love to my wife no matter what. And the goal is, and what happens most of the time, is as a husband love, it energizes his 
wife, to show respect, and then you're in this beautiful, energizing cycle where no matter what, no matter what the situation is, no matter what season you are in, in marriage, there's this constant cycle of love and respect. In, in church, I know sometimes you're like, Christian, is it that easy? No, it's not easy, but it is that simple, I believe. That the scriptures call us in chapter 5, verse 33, God in his foreknowledge, knowing what women need and knowing what men need, have called us to simply love and respect. And so regardless of your spouse's response, you're called by God as husbands to unconditionally love your wives. And wives, you are called to unconditionally respect your husbands because in doing so, what are you doing? In doing so, you're doing it for the glory of Christ. And also, if we go back to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, you're imitating Christ, who is the head of the church, who is the leader, but, but you know what Christ is. He loved everybody, but he was also respectful. He, he was also, you know what Christ was? He also submitted himself on the cross so that we could all be saved. See, Christ is the example, and we do this for his glory. So this morning, as we close, here's what I want to do is, uh, as we take this last song, I, mean, I, I encourage spouses, I mean, spouses, would you just begin praying for your marriage? I don't care how good it is. I don't care how, how bad it is. Would you begin praying for your marriage? If you're here this morning and, uh, you know, you say, Christian, I'm not married. I'm, I'm in middle school. I'm in high school. I'm, I haven't been married yet or whatever the case is. If that's you today, as we take this last song, I encourage you, would you begin praying for your spouse? There's two things you can pray is, uh, you know, if you're a husband, God, help me to be the loving man that I need to be. And then begin praying for your spouse. God, provide me a, a spouse that, that mimics the spouse we see in Ephesians chapter 5. Or maybe you're a lady. God, God, help me to be the respectful wife that, that I'm called to be one day. And then begin praying for your husband. God, help me to find a husband who is going to unconditionally love me as we see in Ephesians chapter 5. You know what I believe? We're going to see stronger marriages. We're going to see stronger families. All for the glory of Christ. And as we sing this last song, you know, some of you, whether you're married or not, here, here's what we know. We know that we have all sinned. You, you know, some of you here, here this morning, you, you hear the idea of, of marriage, but, but your first, the first thing that you need to focus on is that some of you have not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. You, you've never been saved from your sins. You, you know, here's what I encourage you. For, for you to be the husband that you need to be, and for you to be the wife that, that you need to be, to be the very best husband and to be the very ber- best wife, I believe that you may need to be fully committed to God. Like, no, no questions asked. And so if, you, if you're here this morning, and you think to yourself, you know what, Christian, I am lost. I have never asked God to, to save me. I have never confessed of my sins, and I want to be saved today. Because I know to be the man that I need to be, and to be the woman or, or the woman that you need to be, first it starts with Christ. If that's you this morning, understand this, no matter what you've done, no matter your past, Jesus Christ perfectly submitted to the will of his father he died upon the cross and guess what he rose from the grave and now he is the head of the church and one day he's going to come back for us so i encourage you as we sing this last song if you've not been saved make that commitment first and for the rest of us and pray for your spouse pray for your marriage because satan wants to destroy it he wants to confuse you in marriage and he wants you to grow apart even though you're one saved. So let's pray. Father, God, I pray blessings over the marriages at First Baptist Church this morning. God, if, there, if there's someone here this morning who is in a broken marriage, God, not even a broken marriage, but if there's someone here this morning who is just struggling with their spouse, Father, I pray that, that this week they would take this simple concept that you have given us, God, to love and to respect. And God, that they would use this command. God, that they would use this command from you to grow their marriage. And so, God, I pray that you would strengthen them. God, I pray that you would keep the enemy from all marriages in this church. God, that there would be, God, just a rally of believers in this generation and the next. God, that grow up in godly homes where we see unconditional love and unconditional respect. And most of all, that we see marriages that reflect Christ. And, Father, if there's someone here this morning who needs to take that very first step of, of God just, just to be saved and to ask you to save them. God, would you convince them? God, would you convict them? Would you encourage them, Father, through your spirit to come down this morning 
And God, to talk about what a relationship with you looks like. We pray this in your awesome name. And everybody said, amen. Thank you, John. Please come this morning. You may be seated very quickly. Uh, lots of uh, amazing things happening uh, at this church. As a reminder, next week uh, is Mother's Day, and so bring your moms out. Uh, we'll have a gift for all of our mothers. We'll have a photo booth for you guys uh, as well for the families uh, to take pictures. Uh, it's not too late if you'd like to dedicate your child. Uh, we have a few already on the list, but if you decided, hey, I haven't told Christian yet, let me know uh, today if you'd like to dedicate a, a child uh, next week, dear Mother's Day, uh, it'll be a beautiful day. Uh, and then let me have Ray and Michelle. This is Ray and Michelle Young. Uh, they moved all the way from Paris to Russell County. Uh, Paris, Kentucky, though. Uh, I know y'all think of Paris, Tennessee. But, but Paris, Kentucky, uh, and, man, they have, they've been here for the past year and a half. Uh, they moved down. They have seven daughters, which is a miracle. Uh, I went to school. Uh, we actually didn't know this, but I went to school with uh, their daughter at Campbellsville, and so lots of connections uh, with this family. Man, they are awesome, and, and Ray, early on, he's been an encourager. He takes me every Sunday morning, uh, some type of encouraging message, uh, and it's been a blessing for me as a pastor. Uh, they're involved in Sunday school already, uh, and so now they want to join the church, and they're going to move their membership. Uh, what church were you guys at? From Central Baptist in Paris uh, to our church, and so if you rejoice in that decision, would you rejoice by saying Amen. Amen. And then Ray and Michelle, if you'd like to join me in the back, they would love uh, to have everybody greet you this morning. Uh, and then that's all the announcements we have. If you're a guest, hey, come and find us at our guest services center. Uh, and with that said, Stacy, would you close us out? Thank you. Thank you.